Good morning, Second Baptist. It is great to be with you today. I uh, and I gotta say, I enjoyed that last song that our worship team did. It's a great message that we get to remind ourselves of Christians that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That uh, His death on the cross makes it possible for all who believe in Him to come to faith. And, I, and I'm grateful for that this morning. And I um, I always enjoy getting to hear our worship team sing about that. This morning, we are going to be opening up our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And in Ephesians chapter 6, we are going to look at verses 10 through 13. And um, you may be familiar with the verses we read. It's a passage of Scripture that's very popular and very well known. And, and I'll ask you that um, as you find that passage, that you would stand with me for the reading of the Word. And we will be in Ephesians chapter 6 and in Ephesians chapter 6, we will be reading verses 10 through 13. And I will, uh, I will go ahead and begin reading the Scripture with us today, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of, of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We are going to uh, open up our time studying the Word together in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for that message that Jesus Christ set, gives salvation to whoever believes in Him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And God, thank You for the Word we just read and that Your Word is inerrant and sufficient and that we can read it today and that it corrects us and it builds us up for living the Christian life and that You continue to speak in us. It is the living Word of God. Thank You for that, Jesus. And I pray that as we open up the Word of God that You will just bring Yourself glory. I pray that people will not hear my voice, but they will hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to them. I pray that it will not be about what McQuaid Dillard has to say, but it will be about what God has to say and what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And thank you, Lord, for this time we have. Be honored and glorified. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. But um, the passage I just read, it, it mentions the armor of God. Very familiar passage of Scripture. But before we really dive in and unpack it and, and see what God has for us, I just want to set up the context a little bit. Talk about the, the background of this book of the Bible. As you know, the book of Ephesians, it's another letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. I know Pastor Justin, he's, a, he's done a great job with the sermon series going through the book of Philippians. And that's one of Paul's letters. And that was to the church of Philippi. The book of Ephesians, it talks to the church of Ephesus, but it also talks to other Christian congregations that were around during that time. And... Um, it's an interesting book of the Bible because if you look at other books of the Bible that Paul wrote down as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, he had to correct some false teaching. There was misbehavior going on in the church that he had to deal with. You can see that in the book of uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians, but Ephesians is different. He's not really telling them, here's what you're doing wrong. Here's what you need to believe. Be careful about this false teacher that's in your church. He's not really giving any warning about that. Really, his message is just, here's who you are in Christ, and here's what the Christian life looks like for you. And that, that's what we see in the, the early part of Ephesians. He talks about how we are in Christ, how Christ brings us to Himself, He saves us, and how we are in Christ as believers, and that's our new identity. He goes on to explain that as Christians, we're members of the church and what it looks like to serve. And he, uh, he really just fleshes out what it means to know Jesus as Lord and Savior and how we serve as the church and how we live in community with other believers. And in Ephesians 5, and uh, the early part of chapter 6, he starts talking about how we are to be influenced by the Holy Spirit and how that plays out in the home in our marriage, in the workplace, and even in master-slave relationships. Because slavery was a, was a common thing in their day. And uh, people found themselves in that situation, and the apostles spoke to that. But where we're at today is where he kind of just brings it all to a conclusion. 
You may have noticed the very first word in our reading today was the word finally. And that would have gotten the original reader's attention. You know, he, he was basically saying, all right, so here's what it means to be a Christian, but here is the final set of instructions. Here's the best way to sum it up, ladies and gentlemen. That was what the Apostle Paul was saying. And it was a big deal to the original audience. And I'm going to tell you that it should be a big deal for us today, too. It's the Word of God. And it is Paul's final, it's, I guess you could say his final words to this group of believers in this letter. So we need to, we don't need to take it lightly. We need to take it as seriously as the original audience. And the passage that we read, I mentioned earlier that it, it talks about the armor of God. It introduces us to that. And I stole the idea from Pastor Justin. I did a, a, a Google image search of this, of this set of verses. And in Google Images, I, I don't want to disappoint. I know last week he was in Philippians 4.13 and there were people climbing mountains without harnesses. And I couldn't find that today. So I, I hope you're not disappointed about that. But I did find images of armors or sets of armor and swords. And I even found one picture that said the struggle is real and it had a, a sword next to it. So I found all kinds of pictures when I did a, a Google image search of that. And, you know, that's what people think of. And, and it's really important that we recognize the armor of God. And later on, Paul goes on to talk about that in further detail. But really, what I want to focus on today is just that very first thing he tells us is spiritual warfare. He talks about putting on the armor of God to prepare ourselves for spiritual warfare. And I know that this topic, it might seem a little bit random. You know, it's a, a little bit, uh, it, it might seem off base from where we were in Philippians. I know uh, Pastor Justin talked last week about how in Christ we, we have the strength to live the Christian life. And, you know, to talk about spiritual warfare is in a little bit of a different direction. And I really felt the Lord lead me to this as I was praying for a passage to preach. You know, when Pastor Justin asked me to fill in for him, I was praying that God would just lead me to a word of Scripture that would help us today. And this is something that God laid on my heart in light of recent events. Everything that's happened, it's, it's kind of something that I felt the Holy Spirit lead me towards. And I think part of the reason the Holy Spirit laid this passage on my heart is because of Something I've struggled with. I've struggled recently with just assuming the worst about others. And, and I think that's something we all can relate to. And what I mean by that is how we react to people whenever we see that really strongly worded Facebook post that has a very negative opinion. How we respond to people whenever they stand for certain social movements and certain political ideologies that just are... Are, are crazy and just we don't understand. I think that as Christians, where we struggle is we're tempted to see the other person on the end of that screen as our enemy. We're tempted to view that person that wants to blame a certain political party or politician as our enemy. And it, it doesn't just go there. It's not just normal people on Facebook. We see it in the news. Whenever you read a news article, the way the story is often spun is Here's the problem, and it's because of this political party. If you read a certain news source, they'll tell you that it's all the Republicans' fault. If you read another news source, they will tell you that it's all the Democrats' fault. If you read uh, one news source, it'll tell you that you're supposed to support this social movement. If you read a different one, it says this social movement's wrong. You shouldn't support it. And it's very, you know, there's a lot of division that's going around. And I think that... Now more than ever, this is an appropriate passage for us in the 21st century. Because we're all tempted to divide ourselves and view other people as the enemy. And I, I think that the Apostle Paul really hit the nail on the head in verse 12 when he said this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I want to tell you from the Word of God this morning, your enemy is not the person that's telling you to vote for the Democrat or telling you to vote for the Republican are telling you this or that. Your enemy is not that Facebook friend that makes the offensive post. That is not your enemy today. Our enemy is a spiritual one. It's not a political problem. It's not a social conflict. Our greatest threat is a spiritual force. And I want to talk to you about it today because I think that, you know, as Christians, it's important for us to be informed and, you know, do our civic duty to vote. But I don't think that 
the real enemy is going to be defeated in November. I don't, I don't think November the 5th is going to bring the, the true end to our greatest threat as Christians. I don't think so. There's only one solution, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. And another thing I want to talk about and really address with discussing spiritual warfare is that as Christians, we get distracted in our walk with God. We don't take this issue as serious as we want to. I think um, as, as a Christian, something that I've, I've come to learn more recently and, and recognize that I've been wrong about is assuming that spiritual conflict goes away over time. I've just I've naturally assumed that you know as uh, as I spend more time in pastoral ministry as I preach long as I minister to people more that Satan's just going to leave me alone a little bit more and more but that's not what we see in the Word of God. The more that I have read my Bible, the more that I have learned from other pastors, and I've listened to other people talk about spiritual warfare, I've learned that it doesn't go away. I actually. Uh, when I was studying for this, I listened to a sermon from John MacArthur on this passage. And one thing that he brought up is that the longer he had been in ministry, the more he dealt with spiritual warfare. The more time he spent in pastoral ministry and preaching the Word, the more difficulty that he experienced. The sermon that I listened to from him was one that he did back in the late 70s. It was 1979. And the joke that he made with his congregation that morning was that he, had, uh, he didn't want to get out of bed to preach that morning. When he woke up, he told himself, oh no, it's Sunday morning, i got, I got to get up and preach. And he really had to, he had to pray for God's strength to get out of bed and preach the Word that morning. And I think that this struggle I'm talking about, it's not just exclusive to pastors and preachers. It's not something that you only deal with if you stand on a stage and deliver the Word or lead a worship song. This struggle is for everybody. Christians from all walks of life and all types of gifting. We deal with it if we serve in the benevolence ministry. We deal with it if we serve on the AV team. We deal with it if we serve as Sunday school teachers. We face it if we serve on Wednesday nights. In some shape, form, or fashion, we all deal with spiritual warfare. Amen. And I think that it doesn't just happen in the church life. It happens in our marriages. It happens in our family lives. It happens even in the workplace. We deal with spiritual warfare. It can take the form of discouragement. It might take the form of us excusing a personal sin in our lives and acting a certain way. But bottom line, we all deal with it. And really, here's the big idea that I want to throw at you today. Here's the idea that the Word of God teaches us, and it's this. Spiritual warfare is real, but... We can win spiritual battles we face by relying on the strength God provides. Every spiritual battle you and I come into contact with, we don't have to lose. That's the good news. We do not have to do this alone. And we do it in the strength God provides. And, and that gave me the sermon title for today, and it's this. Living in the strength God provides. If we're going to succeed spiritually, we're not going to do it on our own. We're going to do it with the help of God. And as we study this passage more closely today, I want to take that main idea and I want to look at three different key aspects that the Apostle Paul shows us. Because these three key aspects that he brings up in verses 10 through 13 teach us how to win spiritual battles. And the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is in verses 10 and 11, and it's this, it's the resources God gives us. That's our first sermon point. The resources God gives us. We must rely on the resources that God gives us if we are going to succeed in spiritual warfare. If we're going to win those spiritual battles, you are not going to do it in your own strength. If I'm going to win the spiritual battles, I am not going to do it in my own strength. It's only through Christ. It's only through the strength God gives us. And verse 10 is a reminder of that. It says this, it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And the thing that I specifically want to point out to you is that He does not say be strong for the Lord. He does not say be strong even because of the Lord. He says be strong in the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul says. And now I've looked up what that word strong means. In, and what it literally means is enabled. When he says be strong in the Lord, he says be enabled 
in God to live the Christian life. Be enabled in God to live in a way that pleases God. And I think this is something that we really gloss over as Christians. I think as Christians, we have this misconception that in order to live the Christian life, our responsibility is to work really, really hard and just hope that Jesus comes in at some point or another to help us out. I've heard people say that before, you know, well, you know, he's my helper, but I've still got to work hard. But that's not what we're told in the Word of God, ladies and gentlemen. We are told that we receive the strength in God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And according to Paul, if we're to live in a way that pleases God, we have to know Jesus as our Savior and submit to Him as Lord. And to submit to Him as Lord, that means that we completely submit our desires to Him. And whenever we, we allow Him to control every one of our desires, that's when He works through us. That's when He really takes over and that's when we really start to live the Christian life. And, and I want to continue talking about this idea in verse 11. In verse 11, the Apostle Paul starts off saying, put on the whole armor of God. That phrase can be literally translated as be clothed with God. When the original audience heard this, their thought would have been a Roman soldier that would have been heavily armed. A Roman soldier that would have had a full suit of armor that was prepared for war. That's the kind of language that Paul used there. And the message that they would have received is to prepare for spiritual warfare by fully embracing the resources God gives them. And it's the same for us in the 21st century. If we want to succeed in spiritual warfare, we've got to recognize that God is our resource and we have to fully embrace that. And what I mean by that is that we consistently and carefully listen to the Word of God. If you want to know what it means to clothe yourself with God and to put on the whole armor of God, you carefully and consistently listen to the Word of God. If we really expect God to help us stand against temptation and enable us to stand against temptation, then we've got to embrace what the Word of God says. And what that means for us is that we've got to listen to Scripture even when it says things that we don't like. Even when it doesn't get on our personal hobby horse. Even when it, uh, you know, when, when it doesn't deal with the specific political or whatever types of issues. We still need to listen to it. Even when it makes us uncomfortable, we still need to listen to it. I know that there have been many times in my walk with God where I've, I've studied my Bible and I've come across passages of Scripture that convict me. And I know it happens to every single one of us. And my answer for you today in spiritual warfare is that when you have your personal time with God and you come across those passages, you don't need to try to, try to quiet down your conscience or try to ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We need to listen to what the Word of God says. We need to listen. I, I can only think of how many times in my walk with God where I've had those moments where I read uncomfortable passages of Scripture. I just have to say, God, I'm, I'm sorry. What you're saying in your word is right and what I am doing in my life is wrong. And I'm sorry that it doesn't line up, Lord. I'm sorry, God. Forgive me, Lord. I have sinned against you. And I know that that's really different than what we hear in our day and age. In our day and age, we really emphasize comfort. We emphasize trying to reshape Scripture to fit our way of thinking. That's really a, that, that's a major concern right now in churches in the United States, among Christians, that so many people are trying to change the meaning of Scripture to fit their own personal agenda. But I want to tell you today that we can't do that. We've embraced this negative habit of wanting to reinterpret. We want, we've embraced this negative habit of focusing on the historical context in order to rationalize a certain passage of Scripture and make it less offensive to us. But I want to tell you today that that's not, that's not the way it works. If we, um, if we take that stance, then we are trading off our personal relationship with God for comfort. 
And we honestly cannot expect God to bless that or work for it. We can't. We are in no position to honestly say we are clothed with God if our top priority is to make our faith outwardly appealing. We need to commit ourselves to spending more time in Scripture. This is God's way of speaking to us. And I, and I really want to speak on that because of this. I think that as Christians... In the Bible Belt, we, uh, a lot of us have developed the habit of going to church regularly, hearing preaching. And I don't think it's important to be in a church where the Word is preached. I absolutely think that's important. And I, I thank God that um, this morning there are, uh, there are other men in our county and um, throughout the United States that still stand and preach the Word. I, I thank God for that. But I really want to tell you today that if you really want the Word of God to make an impact on your life, don't just leave it at a sermon you hear on Sunday morning. Don't just leave it at that. Because if that's all it is, you're, you are barely scratching the surface of what it means to know Jesus. You can wake up tomorrow morning and open up your Bible and hear a word from God. You can do that. This is the living, breathing word of God and, and you have access to that. And if you really want it to take an impact on your life, I challenge you, read your Bible at home. Read it even during the week. Read it on Saturday. Read it on Sunday. Read it Monday through Friday. Don't just leave it to the preacher to explain it to you. Read it for yourself. And the other thing I want to point out about Scripture is we know that it's infallible in and air. We hear that all the time. That means that God has spoken to us through Scripture and He is without error. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't give us incorrect information. And I, I think that a lot of Christians would agree with me if I said that. I think if I walked outside of this church and walked up to someone in downtown Cedartown and asked them if they thought the Bible was the Word of God, I don't think I would have much difficulty getting someone to say, yeah, I agree, that, that's what my preacher says. You're, you're right to say that. But I think that we also need to recognize that Scripture is sufficient. And that's something that you hear talking about and get thrown around and what we mean by that is that we embrace Scripture as the only thing we need in our lives. We don't need additional resources to grow in our faith. All we need is the Word of God. And the way that we recognize Scripture is sufficient is we submit ourselves to it. We fully embrace its authority. What the sufficiency of Scripture does, it, it takes your statement that you believe in the inerrancy of the Word of God, and it puts it into action. That's what recognizing the sufficiency of Scripture does. And when we embrace the authority of Scripture and recognize its sufficiency in our lives, we're equipping ourselves to do spiritual warfare successfully. You are equipping yourself through that. But the Scripture is, you know, it's important, it's the inerrant Word of God, but I want to tell you today, that's not the only resource you've got to fight spiritual warfare or fight these spiritual battles. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. When you become a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit is the seal of your redemption. This is how the Apostle Paul put it earlier on in the book of Ephesians. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you also receive the Holy Spirit. And this is something that Jesus also spoke of with His disciples. In John 14, before Jesus was crucified, He talked with the disciples about the Holy Spirit. He said this in verse 16, And I will pray the Father, I will ask the Father, and He will give another Helper that He may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit is our seal of redemption and He gives us the strength to live the Christian life. The strength to live the Christian life is not some weird, mysterious, outside force that you just reach at and, and grab for and hope that you eventually get it. No, it's, it's living inside of you today, right now. He empowers us to live the Christian life. And the other resource I want to bring your attention to is this prayer. And I think that as Christians, we really forget the value and just how much of a miracle prayer truly is. 
Because prayer, it's not just reciting words. It's, it's not just something that we do on Sunday morning and that we use pretty words so that way the worship service will flow well. No, that's not prayer. Prayer is us talking to the Creator of this universe. The Creator that spoke you and I into existence and that loves us. The Creator that sent Jesus to die and make a way for us to Him. That's what our prayer life is. And whenever we pray to that God, he, he's there with us. He's not just some cosmic therapist that's emotionally detached. No, he's, he's not just that. He hurts with us. Whenever we're sad about something, He's sad with us. Whenever we are struggling with something, He is struggling with us. Whenever we wonder why we lost a loved one, He's there to comfort us and He is right there with us. We can cry out to God in prayer in our moments of need. And I want to tell you today that if you're struggling to succeed in spiritual warfare, you can pray and ask God for strength and He will hear you and He will listen to you. And it might not be something that gets solved right then and there. It might not be solved 10 seconds from then. It, it might not be. And, and in my life, that's not the way prayer has worked. But He listens to you and He works through that. The first lesson that we learn from Paul about spiritual warfare is that God gives us the resources to succeed in spiritual warfare. But why is it so important? Why, why am I talking about this? I, I spoke on that earlier. And I mentioned the motivation I've got from verse 12, but I've still got some explaining to do about it. You probably still have a lot of questions. I need to talk about what that means, because spiritual warfare is a term that we use very frequently. But what does it mean? And, and really, the second point addresses this. We need to acknowledge the enemy we face. That's point number two today, the enemy we face. If we are to succeed in spiritual warfare, we must acknowledge our true enemy. And in the last half of verse 11 and in the first part of verse 12, that's what the Apostle tells us about. In verse 11, Paul ends that, in that, ends that verse by explaining why we put on the armor of God. Notice the wording. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for the purpose of standing against the wiles of the devil so that you will have the strength to stand against the wiles of the devil. Another way that that word wiles can be translated is schemes. If, if you read the, if you have the New American Standard Bible, in verse 11 it says the word scheme instead of wiles. And they, uh, they both refer to the same thing. They're referring to a scheme of deceit or strategy. A plan for someone to harm another human being. That's how it's used in Proverbs 1.11. It, it says, let us lie in wait for blood. It, it mentions people that want to harm other people. That have the intention of hurting another human being. It refers to a strategy that's put in place to destroy something else. And as Christians, we need to be aware that Satan is doing that right now in our lives. He's seeking ways to distract us in our walk with God and find ways to draw us away from faithfully serving God. The Apostle Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Scripture teaches that spiritual warfare is a real threat. We're facing an adversary that is unable to take away our salvation. I don't believe that as Christians we're able to lose our salvation because of what I see in Scripture. And I don't think that we need to go home and be afraid that the devil can take away what Jesus did for us on the cross. But what he is able to do, he's able to distract us. He's able to hinder us from living in a way that honors God. And the language that Paul uses, that it really helps illustrate that. So we need to understand that Satan is strategic. That, that's an important thing I want to draw your attention to today. And, and I think that we really, um, in the United States, we don't really fully comprehend the threat that uh, the threat of Satan because we're too busy assuming Satan to be a cartoon character. That's just kind of where our mind naturally goes. You may think of a cartoon character with red tights and a pitchfork. 
You might think of that movie, The Exorcist, where you know the girl's head spun around 360 degrees. You might think, oh yeah, that, that's Satan. He made that girl's head turn around in that movie. But I want to tell you today that he's not just some weird force from a horror movie. He's not just from a cartoon. He is a spiritual being that knows our specific weaknesses. And his means of tempting us, it's more strategic than just some over-the-top dark magic show. That's not how Satan tempts us. The way Satan tempts us is through the sinful desires we have. He tempts us in the way of making us think that it's okay to abuse the mercy of God. I've, how many times as Christians we heard other people, and even done this in our own lives, where grace abounds, sin, or excuse me, where, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. How many times in our lives have, have we misused that to justify a sin? I want to tell you that, that that's the devil at work in us, tempting us to think that way. And I want really, uh, to help us understand how Satan tempts us as, as believers. I want to just talk a little bit about how Satan tempted Jesus when Jesus was here on earth. The sinless, perfect Son of God was tempted by the devil when he was on this earth doing his earthly ministry. And it's talked about this in the Gospel of Matthew. Mark mentions this, and Luke talks about it as well. And um, I, I want to quote a verse to you from Matthew's account of this. Matthew 4, 3. Now when the tempter came to him, Jesus, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus experienced temptation from the devil. And I think that Satan was smart enough to understand that he couldn't get Jesus to sin. Jesus was fully human and fully God, but in, in, in his nature, he is not able to sin. Jesus is sinless and perfect, and he could not sin on this earth. What Satan was tempting Jesus to do was misuse his gifts. If Jesus were to give into Satan's temptation, he wouldn't have committed a sin as we think of it, but he would have violated God's plan to fully humble himself. You see, God's plan from the beginning was to send Jesus to this earth so that He may be fully humbled and take on human form and be punished by God for our sins. And the way that Satan tempted Him is that Jesus would violate God's will. You know, what, Jesus, what uh, Satan specifically told Jesus to do was to jump off the summit of the temple in Jerusalem and let the angels catch Him. And uh, Satan was twisting some scripture out of context just in, in that situation. But we need to understand that Satan does a similar thing in our lives. And, and the way he does that, he might tempt us to just live in sin and excuse our behavior. He may tempt us to use our spiritual gifts to draw people to us rather than to Christ. I think that's something that a lot of Christians struggle with. Whenever we grow in our faith and whenever we, you know, we've been walking with the Lord for a while, I think that we can very easily fall into the trap of trying to point other people away from Jesus and point them to ourselves. I think we can make the, the serious mistake of whenever, we, whenever I stand and preach, trying to make people think of McQuaid Dillard instead of Jesus. And, and my prayer is that I never fall into that, that I never give way to that temptation, that I always preach for the glory of God. We're all tempted in that way. And as believers, we're, we know we're made right with God, but the struggle for sin still exists. It's still real. There may be believers that struggle with addiction. There may be believers where they... Sin in the way of wrongly expressing their anger and not submitting their desires to God. But we are given the resource to fight that. And that's our enemy. And verse 12, it really it brings it back to something else I mentioned earlier. We do not fight against flesh and blood. I do think that Satan can use people. I think that he, uh, you know, and he, he works through the hateful things that people may say to us. He works through the apathetic attitude that someone might show to us. But we need to remind ourselves that person is not the enemy. That person is not the one that I should hate. And we need to remember that as it's easy to lash out in anger towards people. It's so easy for us to just, whenever we get insulted by someone or we feel like they're damaging our reputation, to just throw it back at them. To give them a taste of their own medicine. To show them what it feels like. 
But I want to tell you today that the only solution is what Jesus commands. And He said this in Matthew 5, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. That's not what we naturally want to do. As Christians, whenever we get insulted, we naturally want to make that other person feel the pain that we feel. But that's not what Jesus taught us. We cannot honestly expect to point other people to Christ when we explicitly ignore what Christ tells us to do. We can't expect to point people to Jesus when we act nothing like Him. How in the world can we resemble the perfect, sinless Son of God that selflessly gave Himself on the cross for whoever would believe in Him by acting in a hateful and selfish way? How can we do that? And we need to understand too that the love we respond with is the unconditional love that Jesus shows us. It's not the tolerance that we hear about in our day and age. I know that, that's a term that we hear thrown out a lot. And as a Christian, I don't agree with the way that our culture uses that. I don't. You know, we're, we're taught to, you know, tolerance in the form of embracing certain things. And it's, it's interesting to me that as time's gone on, tolerance has become a lot less tolerant. It's become a lot less about loving other people and, and instead it's about embracing a certain mindset. But as Christians, we're called to embrace the unconditional love that Jesus showed us when He died for us. When Jesus is, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, He fills us with His love. He gives us His Holy Spirit so that we can point others to Him. So the true enemy we face today is strategically trying to point us away from that. And the last thing I want to point your attention to is this, in verse 13, the responsibility we have. As a Christian, we have a responsibility. And this is the final aspect of, of putting on the armor of God and, and, and being successful in spiritual warfare that I want to look at. If we are to succeed in those spiritual battles, we have to accept the responsibility God charges us with. And Paul states it very clearly. He says this, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And really the command that Paul gives us is this. Stand. Just stand. You know, you know, the, you know the conflict you're going to have. You know the things you're going to face. Just stand. You hold on to the strength that God gives you so you can Stand. He doesn't end this discussion with saying, all right, here are the list of rules. Monday and Wednesday you do this. Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday you do that. And Saturday and Sunday, here's these other five things you do. He doesn't say that. That's not what he says. He tells us what he said in verse 11. He just reaffirms, put on the whole armor of God. He brings us back to just simply standing in the promises of God's Word, standing in the strength of the Holy Spirit, standing before God in prayer. And the term stand, it, it comes from a Greek word, histomai. And I'm, I'm going to have to look, uh, ask somebody later if I pronounce that correctly. Um, but it means literally to stand firm, to be present, to be established, or to firmly establish oneself. So Paul's literal command is that we exhaust the resources God gives us to be firmly established against the temptations we face from Satan. Psalm 4.4 in the King James Version says this. It says, stand in awe and sin not. And King David wrote that song. And it's interesting to me that he made a very clear connection between standing in awe of God's glory and God's holiness and not sinning against Him. And in Ephesians 6.13, that's the same point that the Apostle Paul makes. If we are to successfully fight our spiritual battles, we do so standing in God's strength. The responsibility of us is to simply trust God. To simply trust Him. And, and I know that the concept of spiritual warfare is overwhelming for us. I told you today that it's something that doesn't get easier. It doesn't go away. It doesn't disappear with time. But I want to tell you today that 
You don't need to be discouraged. You need to be encouraged by what God tells us. We're not fighting this on our own. What makes you successful in spiritual warfare is not your moral ability as an individual. It is God working in you and working through you. That's what gives you strength to live the Christian life. God gives us the resources to battle our true enemy. And I think a, a, good, a, a good final verse that I can share with you is this. It's out of Matthew 28, 20, and it's something Jesus said to His disciples. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As Christians, we need to be encouraged that God simply tells us to trust Him. We simply trust Him. And when we trust Him, that's whenever we succeed in our spiritual battles. We can know that He will work through our lives to bring Himself on and glory. And in my prayer today for everyone that leaves this, this sanctuary and everyone that has heard this sermon, my prayer is that we will acknowledge that there is a spiritual enemy that tries to lead us down a path that dishonors God. As believers, we can be sure that Jesus saved us. We can be sure that He gave us eternal life and that God has a plan for us. But we also need to know that there are temptations we're going to face. And those are temptations that might try to distract us from our walk with God. They may take the form of sins that we're tempted with on a regular basis. We might be tempted to just embrace a set of unbiblical values that the world around us is telling us to embrace. Or it just might be the simple day-to-day -day distractions that keep us from truly going before God in prayer and truly hearing His Word. This is an overwhelming enemy to fight, but it's not one we fight on our own. God speaks to us through Scripture and continues to speak to us through that. The Father always hears our prayers when we cry out to Him and He is concerned about us. When we become believers in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit, the seal of our redemption. And that gives us the power to live the Christian life. And that's how we live in the strength God provides. And really, the, the thing that I want you to consider is we closed out this time of studying the Word together. I want you to consider if you truly know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, because if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you don't have that personal relationship with Him. And you do not have access to this strength, but you can have access to that. Jesus died on the cross for whoever would believe in Him. Whoever would come to, whoever comes to faith in Him. That's who Jesus died for. And you can receive that today. You might feel the Holy Spirit drawing you to God. I, I want to challenge you today. Willingly respond to that. Don't ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Do what Romans 10.9 says. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead and you shall be saved. I want to tell you today that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can receive that and you can receive these tools to win spiritual battles. If you're a believer, you already have access to this. You don't need to scratch your head any longer about how to win these spiritual battles. You don't need to sweat about it. You don't need to go home and pace back and forth about the solution that you can figure out. You've got the tools inside of you and in front of you. And as they come up with a song that we play during our time of commitment, I just I want you to think about that and how you can let this truth shape you and how you can grow more in your walk with God, whether that's accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior or just loving Him more. And I will, uh, I'll, I'll pray for us as they come up. Father in Heaven, thank You that You give us the promise in Your Word that we do not fight this spiritual battle alone. Thank You that the true enemy is one that You give us strength to face. Thank You that You've already conquered Him, Jesus, and all we have to do is to receive that and live in it. And I pray that if someone doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they'll just willingly respond, Jesus. I pray that if someone in here today needs to grow more in their faith and they need your help to do it, that they will just know that they will do it in you, God. That they will ask for your strength and stop trying to do it on their own. In your name we pray, amen.